Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and we are back to Homecoming, part two, chapter five. I hope this living room setting will be a little bit nicer. The lighting is definitely better, so we'll see how it goes. Early the next morning, after they had buried their garbage in the soft soil and washed briefly in the creek, they set off. By the time the sun had fully risen, the four children were back on the road. The morning air tasted cool and clean. At a fork in the road, Dicey headed south because the Choptank River lay to the southeast. This road narrowed and ran between, ran straight between fields of tall ripening corn. They passed farmhouses, barns, and an occasional weathered gray shack raised off the ground on a pile of bricks. Most of these shacks were guarded by thin dogs that yapped at the children from the shade under the houses. Many of the fields were being harvested. People moved up and down the rows gathering corn, squashes, tomatoes, or cucumbers into bushel baskets. Their heads were wrapped with bright red and blue bandanas. They stooped, squatted, or stretched. Even from the road, their fatigue was evident. Sorry, <laughs> something was stuck in my tooth. <laughs> Hard work, James remarked. We need the money, Dicey said, but I'm not sure the little kids can do it. We don't really need the money, do we? You have extra. It was hot. The sun burned high. Dicey was thirsty and impatient. I don't want to be stuck in Crisfield, James. I don't know how things will go there. We've got to have some extra money. We may need it. James considered this. What's our grandmother's name? Abigail. It was in the album. Do you think we could go back to Bridgeport? Do you think Cousin Eunice would take us back? I don't know, James. They passed no stores, no gas stations, just farms surrounded by outbuildings and old pickup trucks. The map shows towns across the chop tank, Dicey said to her family, so even if we don't get lunch, we can eat after we cross it. Does this road go over it, James asked. Dicey shook her head. Then what are we doing? How are we going to cross it? Swim, or wait if it's shallow. How do, do you know how wide it is? How could I know that, Dicey demanded. Stop asking questions. Why? You're driving me crazy with them, that's why. At midday, they saw another sign that said Pickers Wanted. Dicey looked down a long dirt driveway that ran between fields of corn turned to the color of August sunlight. Trees lined the driveway. No house could be seen, although a circle of trees was visible beyond the tops of the corn. I say we try it, Dicey said. Without waiting for an answer, she turned onto the driveway. They followed her. The driveway went straight for about half a mile, then curved to the east. The air was thick and hot. It hummed with the activities of insects. Dicey shifted her bag onto her other shoulder and trudged on. With her free hand, she slapped at bugs. The farmhouses sat within the circle of trees they had seen from the driveway. It was a two-storied building covered with pale green asphalt shingles. It, has a, it had a discouraged look to it. The Tillermans approached the house slowly. A large windowless barn, sided in silvery corrugated metal, made one side of the farmyard. The house made a second. Some small sheds made a third. Tall wire cyclone fences lay on both sides of the house itself. The yard was a three-sided cage. A dog growled and barked, snarled, and leaped angrily up against the fence on the right side of the house. This must be a kennel. The dog needed a kennel. It was a large gray and brown creature, bigger than a setter, with a huge slavering mouth. Its teeth hung long and sharp. It charged against the fence, setting up a clamor that would rouse anyone in the house, Dicey thought. She couldn't make herself step any further toward the screen door of the house, not with that dog there, not even to make money. The screen door opened and a man holding a napkin in his hand stepped out. <clears throat> as soon as he appeared, the dog stopped barking and crouched, fawning and whimpering. The man started toward the children. He was short and slender. He wore overalls and heavy working boots that laced up the front. The shirt under his overalls was dark blue with fancy red and yellow flowers printed all over it. His face was square and blunt. He had gray hair that he had brushed back off his forehead and thin, straight eyebrows over cold eyes. He moved toward the Tillermans without hesitating, without hurrying, and stood silent before them. His skin was tanned and leathery. Deep lines ran across his forehead. He reached his napkin up and wiped his mouth. Yeah, he said. Dicey spoke. You have a sign out front Pickers wanted. She hesitated, but didn't. he didn't say anything. We, my brother and me, we'd like to apply. She motioned, motioned James to come stand beside her. The man didn't speak. He studied them through hard gray eyes. We can work, Dicey said. She waited. He didn't speak. What do you pay, she asked. Fifty cents a bushel. You could pick a lot of bushels in a day. That would be okay. Will you hire us? Yes, he said. What about the smaller ones, he asked Dicey. 
They'll come with us and help, Dicey said. They won't cause any trouble. Name's Rudyard, he said. What's yours? Verker, Dicey said quickly. That seemed to be all he wanted to know. Except, what's hers? He demanded, pointing at Maybeth with his head. Maybeth, Dicey said. Something was wrong here. Something she couldn't put her finger on. Well, it wasn't her problem. They would work an afternoon and take their money. He told them to get up into the back of a dusty old pickup truck the color of canned peas. He drove them on a flat dirt road that led around the barn and behind it before, before heading up, straight up a slight incline through an overgrown field to another field. This was a long field of tomatoes. The plants were crowded with weeds, grasses, and low vines. You could barely see the rows they had been planted in, but the tomatoes had grown red and plump. They shone out from the weeds like bulbs on a Christmas tree. At one corner of the field, a mound of bushel baskets waited. The tillerman scrambled down. Mr. Rudyard didn't even get out of the truck. I'll be by at dark, he said. He backed the truck around and drove off. Dicey watched it go into the distance, back to the barn, then around it and out of sight. Creepy, James said. You can say that again, Dicey agreed. Maybeth, you okay? Maybeth nodded, wide-eyed. How long do we have to stay? Sammy asked. They all felt uneasy. Dicey tried to reassure them. Just this afternoon, then we'll take our pay and get out of here, okay? They got to it. Because they were hungry, Dicey decided they could each eat two tomatoes. That was fair enough, she figured. Then they all worked together, pushing or pulling weeds away from the tomato plants. One would hold back the overgrowth, and the rest would reach in for tomatoes, wrestling the fruit from the stems. Their legs and hands and faces were scratched. They had bug bites on every part of their bodies. Dirt was smeared across their faces and arms and legs. They left the filled baskets where they were when they finished with them. After an hour, they had completed one row. Two to a basket, they carried the bushels down to where the pile of empty baskets waited. They had six baskets. Three dollars, Dicey said. Dicey's back ached from bending over. Her hands stung where small scratches had accumulated. She had never felt such heat before, an air that closed down over her and made her, it hard to breathe. Hot, James said. It's too hot, Dicey. You two take a break, Dicey said to Sammy and Maybeth. Go off and explore a little. Stick together, though. When you're rested, come back and help. Remember our name? Vereker, Sammy said. What's that? Our father's name, Dicey said. That's right, James said. How'd you know that? So what, Sammy said. I like Tillerman better. Sammy and Maybeth wandered off down the edge of the fields, going away from the house and the dog. Dicey and James got back to work. This row took longer. James grew sloppy and Dicey had to nag at him to keep at it and find all the ripe tomatoes that grew on the plants and on the long vines that crawled along next to the dry earth. My back hurts, he protested. I'm hot. His face was streaked with dirt and sweat. His eyes wavered between anger and self-pity. He crouched unwilling by her side. It's only for an afternoon, Dicey snapped at him. Sammy and Maybeth returned before they had finished the row. There's another field, Sammy reported, and a river. I wanted to go swimming, but Maybeth wouldn't. The chop tank, Dicey said. Could we swim across it, James asked Sammy. Sammy nodded. Dicey shot a triumphant glance at James. It's not wide, Sammy said. I could swim it easy. Can we go now, Dicey? Maybeth asked. Dicey almost said yes. They all looked at her waiting. She shook her head. Not before we get paid, she said grimly. Don't worry, we'll be all right, as long as we're together. At late afternoon, when the sun was beginning to lower and the mosquitoes were beginning to rise, the green pickup truck returned. The children went eagerly to meet it. Mr. Rudyard had the dog in the front seat with him. He climbed down and pulled on a long rope to get the dog to follow him. The Tullermans crowded together. The dog snarled at them. There's a bag in the cab, Mr. Rudyard said to Dicey. The missus said I had to feed you something. He walked off down to the far end of the field. What's he going to do? Maybeth whispered. I don't know, Dicey said. Fear climbed up from her stomach to her throat. A sour metallic taste was in her saliva and she swallowed it down. She made herself climb up and get the paper bag from the seat of the cab. Mr. Rudyard had left the keys in the ignition. Mr. Rudyard tied the dog to a tree using the end of the long rope. When he came back, D Dicey had decided what to do. We can't pick anymore, she said. We have to go now, she said. He looked at her out of cold eyes. Then he said, if he runs against that sapling, it'll snap. He got back into the truck and leaned out the window. I keep him hungry, he remarked. He backed the truck around and drove off. In the silence, Dicey could hear insects humming. What does he want? She demanded. Nobody could answer her.
We might as well eat, Dicey said. They all sat down. Mrs. Rudyard had packed a tall thermos of milk and a package of tall biscuits slathered with butter, with slathered, slathered, that's easy to say, with butter and bright strawberry jam. They passed the thermos around. The biscuits looked delicious. Dicey took a bite of one and her stomach closed against it. She put it down on the wax paper. Even James couldn't eat. They looked at one another. I'm sorry, Dicey said. Well, I don't care. I'm not picking any more, Sammy announced. He threw his unfinished biscuit into the pile and they scattered around, like fallen blocks. And you can't make me, he said to Dicey. Dicey couldn't help smiling at him and that made her feel better. I won't try, she said. James, what can we do? I'd like to kill him and hit him, Sammy said. He scares Maybeth. Maybeth had big tears in her eyes. There's the dog, James said, and the man. Absent-mindedly, he picked up a biscuit. He took a bite, then tossed it down again. He's crazy, Dicey. That crazy, she agreed. Don't get on that truck again, no matter what. He wants us to be scared, Maybeth said. He wants to hurt us. Dicey nodded. Her mind was working and working, and she couldn't think of anything. James just stared at her. She picked up her maroon bag from where she had put it beside the bushels. She took out all of the money and jammed it into her pocket with the jackknife. With a jackknife, if she had to, she could try to fight the man or the dog. She stuffed the map into the waistband of her shorts. We're going to have to run, she said. When he comes back for the dog, James, you take Maybeth. Maybeth, no matter what, you stick with James. Sammy could take care of himself. Go for the river. What about you, James asked. I'm not sure. Dicey tried to keep her voice normal. She had gotten them into this mess, and if anyone got caught, it should be her. I'll do something. You just keep ready to run. And it was deep twilight, shadowy and still, when the truck returned. The Tillerman sat where Mr. Rudyard had left them. The highlights shone on them briefly. The headlights shone on them briefly. He backed the truck so that its back section was where the filled bushel baskets waited, and its nose pointed almost straight down the road to the farmhouse. He got out and looked at them. You're not much use, he observed. Maybeth grabbed Dicey's hand as his eyes rested on her. I'll just have to teach you. Now load up, he ordered. He walked down to the dog, which barked a greeting. How does he know we're alone? James wondered. Quiet, Dicey said. She looked into the cab to see if the keys had been left there. They had. Okay, now listen. When he's to the dog, tell me. And when I say run, you run. All of you, as fast as you can, you hear? They nodded. Dicey got up into the truck. She tried to forget about the man at the far corner of the field. She looked for the key and found it. She turned on the engine. Nothing happened. She looked at the transmission box. A needle pointed to D. Quickly, she shifted to N. Now, Dicey, James whispered. She took the key again and the engine caught. Dicey looked back over her shoulder. Mr. Rudyard ran toward them, his mouth open in a yell. The dog ran ahead of him at full cry, but held back by the rope that his master had looped around his shoulder. James, Dicey yelled, now run! She shifted into D and turned the wheel so it would head straight down the road to the barn. If she got it started, she figured, the incline would keep it going. She pushed on the accelerator and threw herself out of the cab. The ground surged up to meet her as the cab door slammed against her shoulder. It hurt, but she didn't have the time to worry about that. She rolled onto her feet and looked to see her family waiting, watching her. Go, she shrieked. Dacey led them into the middle of the tomato field, away from the man and the dog. It was harder running, especially for Sammy with his short legs, but it would be harder for Mr. Rudyard, too. She let James and Maybeth pass her and slowed until she was behind Sammy, too. They weren't going to go without her. She didn't have time to know how she felt about that. She glanced over her shoulder. Mr. Rudyard was already letting the dog's rope fall from his shoulder as he ran after the truck. He would catch it easily, but how soon? The dog looked after his, mas after his master for a second and then bent his head to the ground, snuffling something. Probably their scent, Dicey thought, turning her head back and making a burst of speed to catch up. Across the tomato field and then across the next field, where young corn made a narrow path for them to follow, they ran. Dicey tried to listen for the sound of the dog behind them or the sound of the motor coming out of the darkness, but she could hear only their labored breathing and the stamping of their feet. She charged through the row of brush and small trees that separated the second field from the river, grabbing Sammy's hand, pulling him with her. The earth fell away from beneath her feet and she tumbled into water. Water closed warm over Dicey's head. She shut her eyes. She held tight onto Sammy's hand. How deep was it? Her toes touched muddy river bottom and she pushed up. She shot out of the water. It was only up to her chest. James, Maybeth. Here, James spoke just beyond her. 
It's warm, Sammy said. In the distance, a truck motor roared. Straight across, then right downstream, okay? Stay close. They set out into the darkness, paddling quietly across. Through the gentle sounds of water, Dicey could hear their breathing. Dark water was all around them, and the dark land behind, and the dark land ahead. Every now and then, she lowered a tentative foot to touch bottom. The river was no more than 50 or 60 yards across, and it wasn't long before Dicey saw the opposite bank rise over her head, capped by a tangle of undergrowth and trees. She put her foot down again. It sank into the mud. Dicey and James were tall enough to touch bottom, but the water was over the heads of the smaller children. So Dicey and James each carried the weight of a younger one floating behind. They made their way cautiously, silently, quickly downstream. They didn't speak, not even when they heard the man breathing through the bushes behind them upstream. Sounds of someone walking hastily through the underbrush across the river. James moved doggedly on, and Dicey followed him. They were near enough to get out and run if Mr. Rudyard dove into the water to pursue them. They could hide in the bushes on this side. He didn't have the dog with him. The sound ceased as if someone were standing still to listen. James stopped too, but she pushed him on with an impatient hand. The water gurgled around them. The crackling sounds began again, hurrying away. The darkness around Dicey lifted as if a blanket had been taken off her head. There was no actual change, of course. Only the night seemed cool and empty, and the clear dark silhouettes of bushes and trees above them seemed to move back to give her more room, and the broad river seemed to float peacefully beside them. They kept, dis they kept silent for another half hour, working their way down river. At last, Dicey spoke. Let's get out. James, can you lift Sammy? Sammy, do you mind being first? Of course not, Sammy said. James hoisted the little boy up onto the bank. Sammy reached down to help Maybeth scramble up. Dicey pushed James from behind, and he turned around to pull her up, with, while her feet slipped against the muddy bank, searching for a firm hold. They sat, huddling together, shivering, but not from a chill. Dicey turned to look behind them, where flat farmland stretched off. No windows shone, but she could see a pair of headlights far off, moving on in a straight line. There must be a road. Not him, Dicey said. She kept her voice low. Danger lurked all around them, always. She knew that now. It couldn't be him. There aren't but two bridges over the river, and they're miles away. What about the dog? Sammy asked. Dogs can't track through water, Jane said. Dicey remembered the dog, snuffling at the ground for their scents. Then she began to giggle. It was eating the biscuit, she cried. He couldn't get it to chase us because it was hungry. Doesn't that serve him right? This set them all giggling, even Maybeth. They kept their laughter low, and after a while, they lay back on the grassy bank and slept close together. So that was a suspenseful chapter, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Please give this a thumbs up if you did, and please be sure to like and subscribe. Well, I already said like. Subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want to be notified of future uploads. I will be back more than likely tomorrow with chapter six of part two, and I definitely think that this filming setup is better, so let me know in the comments. Um, you can definitely see my face better if you want to see my face. <laughs> But um, I personally, I if I were you, I would probably be listening to this with my eyes closed, which is what I tend to do with audiobooks. It helps me relax, especially when I've got a migraine or I'm not feeling well. So anyway, I hope you liked. Thanks for watching and listening, and I'll be back soon with more stuff. Bye, guys.